All right, good day, good morning, good evening, good night to you, wherever and whenever you're watching me. This is your brother and friend, Maurice. And what are we talking about this time around? Well, we are continuing in a, into part eight, into our deep dive into chapter one of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about the tribulation and which day is the Lord's day. And you're watching the New Cosmos video cast. This is the New Cosmos video cast. You've never heard it like this anywhere. Right, welcome today we are continuing our series of videos on chapter 1 of the revelation of Jesus Christ this is our eighth video <laughs> in this multi video series and as we well know each video has three points and if you have not yet watched the first seven videos I will place a link on the top right corner <laughs> of this video or if I forget, you may go to the New Cosmos Videocast channel, look in the playlist, which is entitled Revelation of Jesus Christ. And you will see all seven plus this one. In this eighth video I will call The Tribulation and the Lord's Day. Now remember, if you appreciate this content and you think that it is important, please like, please share, please subscribe. You can support the channel by giving or by purchasing one or both of my books or you may make a purchase from the merchandise store. The links are in the description of this video as well. We have started our masterclass. You may also head over there. You may subscribe. You're looking at the at living in the new cosmos. That's the title of that seminar. So with that said, we will look at point number 22 when I come back. So we are ready to begin our study. This is part eight in our study of Revelation chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're going to begin with point number 22. And point number 22 says, the tribulation was in John's time. The tribulation was in John's time. And our text for that point are Revelation 1, 9, Acts 14, 21 to 22. Matthew 24, 21 and 34. Revelation 7, 9 to 10, 13 to 14. Revelation 2, 3, 9 to 10. And Galatians 4, 29 to 30. And so we want to begin with our main text, which is Revelation 1, verse 9 for this point. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in, Christ, in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. All right. <clears throat> so John was on the Isle of Patmos. And John lets us know that he was a partner in the tribulation, right? He was a partner in the tribulation, a co-participant, one who partook or was experiencing the tribulation and, and what tribulation that was. You see, many times we kind of do, well, I have to speak for myself, for many long years, many years, I did not realize that John's audience, Jesus' audience, the apostles' audience were all the same. <laughs> okay? 
It's not like John was speaking to people 2,000 years away from him. John's audience was the same people who Jesus spoke to. John's audience was the same people who the apostles were preaching and writing to. Okay? So when Jesus talked about the tribulation and John talked about the tribulation, it's the same tribulation. <laughs> okay? So John was in the tribulation that Jesus spoke about. Right? And John was in the tribulation that the apostles spoke about. For example, if we go to Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Okay? And the book of Acts is like a, a historical record of... The, 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 the acts of the disciples, of the apostles, from the time that uh, Jesus was uh, resurrected or ascended until just before the city of Jerusalem was besieged by the Romans. And so it says there, <clears throat> when they, that's the apostles, when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. So the, 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 the apostles made disciples and they strengthened them as well, okay? Encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many, what? Tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, when you, st when you consider <laughs> the audience to whom Paul, well, not Paul, sorry, the, um, Luke, who was the author of the, of the book of Acts, but um, the disciples here were Paul and Barnabas. Right? Yes, Paul and Barnabas. When you consider the audience to whom Paul and Barnabas were speaking to, were speaking to at that time there were me, there was much tribulation for a believer who desired to enter into covenant into the kingdom of God through the covenant with Christ okay so even even the apostles in verse 19 here it says but the Jews were the main instigators of this tribulation against the believers. It says, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded, you notice what they did? They persuaded the crowd. <laughs> okay? They persuaded the crowd. They stoned Paul and dragged, and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Okay? So many of the, the Jewish leaders coming from the Sanhedrin and under the orders of the high priest, they went about and they stirred up the people against the, the apostles and the, and the believers. And that is where the persecution, that is where the tribulation against Jesus' uh church the body of christ that is what that is where that was the source of that tribulation and then among the gentile believers the jewish leaders did the same thing <laughs> they stirred up the gentile people against the gentile believers okay so it is that is why paul paul and barnabas said to the believers it said, it said to them that through many tribulations, they would enter the kingdom of God. Now, when you compare that to today, yes, maybe there are in very uh, limited areas in the world, mostly in like the Muslim countries, where, yes, believers have to enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations. But generally speaking, <laughs> in the other part of the, of, of the world, people don't care whether you accept 
whatever religion you want to, to be, you practice your religion in peace, right? You may have a little disagreement and conflict with people, but not to the, not to the extent that you would be stoned and put to death for what you believe, right? And so many Christ, modern Christians today believe that if they have a, a disagreement with their, their family member or their employer, that's, the tri that's tribulation for them. That's not tribulation. <laughs> what these believers went through at the time, at the historical time to whom the disciples were preaching to and who Jesus said they would have tribulation, that is that they had tribulation, <laughs> right? And that was the context of what Jesus was talking about. That was the context which the apostles were speaking about. And that was the context which John wrote in, in, in Revelation 1, 9, that he too was a partner in the tribulation because of the fact not only did he have uh, put, was persecuted by the Jews but the Romans under the instigation again of the Jews caused John to be imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos <laughs> right so John was in that same very tribulation experiencing that very same tribulation which Jesus had spoken about in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24 Verse 21, for example, okay, so when we are not looking today, we are not looking for the tribulation that Jesus spoke about, nor the tribulation, which is the same tribulation that, that John mentioned in Revelation 1-9, nor the tribulation that Paul and Barnabas preached about in Acts chapter uh, 14. Yes, we may have tribulation of, of, of one uh, sort or the other, but it is not the tribulation that Jesus spoke about. <laughs> Jesus spoke about a specific tribulation. Paul was referencing that specific tribulation as they were in that tribulation. John was talking about that same specific tribulation because he was in that tribulation. All right, so let's read uh, Matthew 24, verse 21. Jesus here speaking, as we see the words are in red. He said, for then, okay? So he's talking about a specific time. The word then here is the Greek word tote, right? At that time, there will be a great tribul there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. So Jesus was referencing a specific tribulation to happen at a specific time in a specific location, right? And that tribulation was all in the context of everything he had said and, all, and the question that he was addressing, which was, when shall the destruction of Jerusalem and the temples and the, uh, the buildings of the temple and the temple buildings be destroyed? <laughs> right? So it was during that time there was this great tribulation. And Jesus says that was a specific one time unique tribulation because he says there was never one like it. And there would never be another like it. <laughs> because specifically, that tribulation had to, do, had to do with the people of Israel who, have, who no longer exist. <laughs> you cannot find a person today who can trace their line back to the original tribes of Israel. Yes, people will come with all sorts of conspiracy theories <laughs> but if you ask them can you trace where is your where is your documentation to trace your line back to a tribe of Israel they ca it cannot be done <laughs> okay so those that those people have been scattered they have been disseminated they have been mixed right 
and that kingdom of Israel no longer exists. That is why the tribulation that came to it at its that brought it to its end, there will never be another one like it. <laughs> All right? That was the tribulation. Look at what Jesus said in uh, verse 34. He said, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass. Well, when he said, I say to you, who is the you that he was speaking to? Was it, was it us in the 21st century? <laughs> you see, we fail to realize there were actual real people standing in front of Jesus and he was having a conversation with them. So when he said, I say to you, he was speaking to them. And he was telling, he's saying to them that this generation, meaning the generation which they were living in. In other words, they, this thing would happen in their lifetime. That's what the word generation conveys, the meaning. Okay? So he says, this, your lifetime will not pass until all these things take place. You would live to see these things. And indeed... As we read there in Acts chapter 14 testified that the tribulation was already underway in the book of Acts. As we read in Revelation 1, 9, John was already in the tribulation. Good. So we have to read and understand things in their proper context. So according to Jesus... The tribulation was to happen in the generation of Israel to whom he had come to, whom he had been sent. Okay? <clears throat> so, Jesus also had said that the old heaven and earth, which is the old covenant relationship between God and man, he said that old heaven and earth would pass away when all things written in the law and the prophets were fulfilled. Right? So that tribulation had to come to pass before the old heaven and earth relationship passed away. Well, the old heaven and earth relationship was ultimately represented by the old covenant temple. Right? Because the temple was made after a pattern of heavenly things. So the old covenant temple represented heaven and earth. Right? And so all the things had to be brought to pass. All the prophecies given in the law and the prophets had to come to pass, had to be fulfilled before the destruction of the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, that world ended. That age ended. So, so they were still, at the time of uh, the disciples and the time of John, there were still a few prophecies remaining to be fulfilled, such as the Feast of, uh, uh, of, of, of Tabernacles. <laughs> right? Because the, 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 uh, the appointed time of tabernacles demonstrated when God and man had become one. Okay? When God would now be dwelling in and among his people. So that was still being, uh, brought, being fulfilled or brought to pass. And it would come to its fulfillment... When, the when Jesus would come in the glory of his Father to fill the believer, right? And start the new uh, tabernacle, the new temple, which is the temple of the believer. Good? So Paul said in Colossians that there were still shadows of things. Those feast days were still shadows of things about to come. If you read it in a properly translated Bible. Right? So those things were still to be fulfilled, but the time was near. As Revelation chapter 1, we read in chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, the time was near for the 
complete fulfillment of all those things which Jesus talked about that they would be fulfilled in that generation, which was in John's generation. <laughs> so no matter which way we spin, we all have to come back to the time of John. Right? <clears throat> so John was testifying now in Revelation 1, 9 that he was in that tribulation which, uh, which occurred during the transition period, the setting up of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And all the events which Revelation spoke about would occur in John's time. As Revelation 1 verses 1 to 3 said, the things were near and they were about to come to pass and they, were, they would happen in a short time. Okay? <clears throat> Let's look at also Revelation 7 verse 9 to 10. Revelation 7 verse 9 to 10. Let's look at that. And uh, John here in vision... He says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And we went through this already. The palm branches represent or are taken from or point back to the Old Testament uh, uh, ceremony of the, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles. Right? The appointed time of tabernacles where the Israelites had to make these tiny um, homes or huts or boots in which they would dwell in for seven days. Right? And those boots and those tabernacles or those miniature temples represent that every man was now a temple for God to dwell in. <laughs> right? This is, this is fulfillment of God saying, I will dwell with my people and I will dwell in them, right? So, so, the, so the fulfillment in Revelation 7 now, the fulfillment of that had come. And once that fulfillment had come, well, then the old system in which God dwelt in the earthly t uh, physical temple, that would be done away with, right? Because the better had come. So, verse 10, they were crying with a loud voice, salvation or hosanna belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, okay? Salvation had come. So, verse 13 says now, and then one of the elders addressed me and saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great, out of the great tribulation, <laughs> They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now remember, again, we always have to go back to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. They have washed, they have come out of the great tribulation, which happened in John's time. <laughs> right? Because John was also one of those who was washing his robe in the blood of the Lamb. He clearly says in verse 9, he was, an, uh, uh, at that time, partaking in the tribulation. Paul, or, or, or um, Luke, testified that Paul and Barnabas preached to the believers in their time that they, would, they were entering into the kingdom through tribulation. <laughs> Good? So... When we, when we, when we read the, 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 the New Testament writers in their correct historical perspective and context, we can see clearly that all of these things were contemporary to their time. Right? John wrote to seven historical churches, not seven symbolical churches. <laughs> there were seven real historical churches contemporary churches in Asia Minor which at the time of John were going through the tribulation as well <laughs> let's read Revelation chapter 2 verse 3 and then we'll read 9 and 10 as well 
Okay, Revelation 2 verse 3. This is the, the message to Ephesus, right? The Ephesians. Jesus said, I know you are enduring patiently <laughs> and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. So, well, there is they were going through tribulation. They were enduring the tribulation patiently. They were bearing up in the tribulation for Christ's sake. And they had not grown weary in the tribulation. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty. <laughs> but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Notice Christ identified those who were the source of this tribulation, the Jews, right? And not the Jews as in the true Jews who were born of the spirit, but those who were of the flesh, right? And they were the instigators of the tribulation. Right? Everywhere you turn in the New Testament writers, you find the same narrative. You have to, you have to be very creative and very stiff-necked to actually force this narrative out 2,000 years to make it into our time and in our future. Right? He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. <laughs> These were the churches in Asia Minor. These were not the churches in Jerusalem now. These were the churches in Asia Minor. They were going through tribulation. They were washing their robes and making them white in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> right? Behold, the devil is about, or the adversary is about to throw some of you into prison. Right? That you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. <laughs> right? So this, some of these people died. <laughs> because of their faith and during that tribulation. Okay? As we discussed in the previous um Lesson, the kingdom of heaven was on the transition. So even as the spiritual aspect of that kingdom, God's kingdom on earth, even as the, the spiritual aspect was increasing and would remain, the fleshly and natural aspect was fading away. Right? The, 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 the Levitical and Aaronic priesthood was fading away. The, the, the sacrifices and the blood sacrifices and the offerings and the food offerings and the drink offerings, that was fading away. Right? The physical building temple, that would be destroyed at the end of the age. And the, the, the spiritual temple, the temple of the believer, would be established, would replace it. Those who had been stewards and priests of the kingdom under the first, first phase, natural Israel, they became the persecutors. They became the source of the tribulation of those who were entering into the second or spiritual phase of the kingdom of heaven. Galatians 4, 29 to 30 tells us that. Okay, Galatians 4, 29 to 30. 30. It says there, Paul writing, he says, But just as at that time, speaking of the conflict between the two sons of Abraham, Ishmael and uh, Isaac, right? Just at, as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, which was Is Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, which was Isaac, so also it is now. When he says now, he means 
in the time of the apostles, in the time of John. In the time of John, there was persecution happening. <laughs> right? And the persecution was those who were born according to the flesh. Well, who was that? <laughs> that was natural Israel at that time. And those who were born of the Spirit were who now? The remnant, the body of Christ. <laughs> okay? They were being, the body of Christ was being persecuted by corporate Israel. Under the instigation of the priests, the Sanhedrin, right? The leaders, the kings of the earth, the rulers of the people. Verse 30 says, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. The slave woman was Hagar, her son was Ishmael. So the scripture was saying in allegorical form that there would come a time where Israel would be cast out. These were the original sons of the kingdom. They would be cast out. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. <laughs> right? The son of the free woman would be Sarah, in which Paul says that was new Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem. Right? So the tribulation that Jesus was speaking about, the tribulation that Paul was speaking about, the tribulation that John was speaking about was that which occurred during John's time, during the apostles' time, in which corporate Israel, flesh Israel, natural Israel, persecuted the sons of the kingdom, the sons, of, the sons who were born according to the Spirit, which was the body of Christ, the believers in Christ. That was the tribulation which Jesus was referring to. And as well, because of that persecution that corporate Israel, that natural Israel had, had uh, inflicted on the body of Christ, they too would go through a great tribulation in which the, the, uh, the, the Romans now would besiege their city. And within that, the walls of Jerusalem now, there would be a terrible tribulation for those Jews in which they, 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 they were deprived of food and they, 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 they came to pass where the women would be eating their, their own children. And they, every man's hand was against each other. They had civil war. And they were killing one another. And then at the final, the Romans came in and destroyed everything as well. Right? That was the tribulation that Jesus spoke about. And so we will look at point number 23 when I come back. So we are ready to look at point number 23. And point number 23 says, The Lord's day was not a weekday. <laughs> the Lord's day was not a weekday. And our text there are Revelation 1.10, Joel 21, 1-11, Isaiah 13, 1-11, Hosea 5, 6 to 20 and 26 to 27, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 4. So we go to our Bible. We, our main text for this point will be Revelation 1 and verse 10. John writing says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now... <laughs> I know when I was, uh, what, what I received from the denomination that I was baptized into, 
was that this Lord's Day was a specific day of the week. <laughs> and there have been countless debates and arguments and fighting as to which day of the week is the Lord's Day for the Christian. Some would say, well, it still remains the seventh day, which um, translates to Saturday in, in, in our calendar, in our time. Some would say, no, it is Sunday, the first day of the week, or the first day of the week, which translates to Sunday according to the modern calendar. But I want to say that as far as I see, <laughs> from the teachings of the apostles, that anyone that is in Christ, they are no longer obligated to, to observe any religious day. As a matter of fact, Paul said that we should not be observing days, nor weeks, nor months, nor years. <laughs> right? In the, 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 in, the, in the new covenant, in the covenant that we are in Christ, we are no longer to observe for religious purposes any particular day of the week. Now, if as a, as a, as a congregation or as an as a, a organized body of believers, you want to choose a day that you feel is best suited for um, fellowship and for coming together, whichever day you pick, that's okay with the Lord. The scripture says in Romans 14, Whatever day you choose to dedicate it to the Lord, dedicate it to the Lord. And the Lord accepts that. All right? But anyway, <laughs> I know some people feel very strongly about this thing. So, But that, that's how, when I read, that's what I see in the scripture. Okay? But anyway, so John says he was in the spirit. Right? <laughs> in the spirit. Now, in the spirit, there are no days, weeks, months, <laughs> no years, right? And he says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So what's this Lord's day that John was speaking about? Now, again, you see, we, we are so divorced from the culture and uh, of the Hebrew people, right? That we don't catch a lot of things. Now, the Hebrew people, this was not the first time they, they, they were hearing about this Lord's Day. The Lord's Day was in the Hebrew uh, literature, the, the writings of the prophets, hundreds of years, right? So they knew about the Lord's Day. So we have this scenario of John being exiled on this secluded island of Patmos. I think there, there, there was some sort of military fort there or some military um, building uh, there. And uh, so he was there, but it, it was not like a place where there was um, people resided there. It was some sort of military uh, fortress. But anyway, they kept prisoners there. And so he was separated from the congregations which were under his supervision. But he was not beyond the reach of Jesus. <laughs> so it was while he was on this island, this secluded island, that he went into the spirit. His mind was taken away in vision from beholding his natural surrounding and circumstances. And he was made to behold, in his mind's eye, the events that would occur in the Lord's day. <laughs> now, the Lord's day, in the Hebrew uh, mindset, or the day of the Lord, is not a weekday. It was not a Sunday. It was not a Saturday, nor any other particular day of the week. The Lord's day was not a 24 hour period but it was a time of judgment that the old covenant prophets as well as Jesus 
John the Baptist and the apostles all spoke about the day of the Lord. Okay? So the day of the Lord, both historically and during the time of the, the apostles and disciples, was known to be a period of time when the Lord's judgment would be poured out upon specific nations. That day could last for months <laughs> or even years. So it's not, it was not a literal day. Okay? And even when we look at what um, John said here in verse 10, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet that indicated that the time of the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, was being fulfilled. Right? And historically, again, the Jewish people understood that the blowing of the trumpet was historically heralding, announcing the day of the Lord. For example, if we look at Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? So we're going to look at an old covenant prophet who wrote, I think Joel would probably have written about six or seven hundred years before Christ. Okay? Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet. Blow a what? <laughs> Blow a trumpet. That's what John heard behind him, right? The sound of a trumpet. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land, and that would be the holy land of Zion, tremble for what? The day of the Lord is coming. It is near. <laughs> right? So we have right here, the Lord's day and a trumpet all in one verse. Right? So when John talks about the Lord's day and trumpet, he's not talking about Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> he is talking about the day of judgment, which historically was announced by the blowing of a trumpet. Okay? Verse 2. Let's, he's going to talk more about this day of the Lord, the Lord's day. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness. There is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generation. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them this is an enemy army this is an enemy army coming up to zion or to jerusalem right to destroy right behind them is destruction right it says their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on tops of the mountains. And like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Right? So, most times, days of the Lord were days of... Not most times, all the time. Days of the Lord were days of judgment, but most times that judgment was carried out via an enemy army invading and destroying whatever nation, whatever city that was being judged. All right? And Joel here in verse 1 wrote about a soon coming day of the Lord. Right? In, in this very chapter, as a matter of fact, in Joel chapter 2, Joel mentions two days of the Lord. <laughs> there was one which was soon, which was near, and there was another which would come in the last days. Right? So again, we know and we see that God, when God says something is near, he means it is it's going to happen in that generation. And when he says something is going to happen in the last days, it, he was talking about in the last days of Israel, right? But anyway, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, um, look more up, uh, on the second Lord's Day, Day of the Lord, in our 
in the next point, in point number 24. But for this point, we're going to look at the first one, which was a day of the Lord, which was near at hand to the first temple Jerusalem. Okay? First temple Jerusalem. That is when Solomon's temple was still standing. This day of the Lord would come in that time. Right? During the time of first temple Jerusalem. And that was the time when the Chaldeans of the kingdom of Babylon under the, under the, the, the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. This was the day of the Lord that Joel was talking about here. Where we, ju we just read with the blowing of the trumpet and so on. And the army that was coming was the Babylonian army. Was the Chaldean army. Right? They came... And they, they conquered the southern kingdom, Jerusalem and, and the kingdom of Judah. They destroyed Solomon's temple and they carried away the Jews captive to Babylon. That is when you read Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. You read there where Daniel was one of those captives carried to Babylon. <laughs> right? Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2 was as a result of the day of the Lord, which came as a result or from what Joel here was, had, uh, had warned about. That day of the Lord resulted in Daniel and his Hebrew friends being taken away captive to Jerusalem. <laughs> All right? Yeah, you see, the, the Bible is not a series of disjointed stories, right? There is a historical narrative that is running through all of these different books of the Bible, right? And it is all surrounding Israel. It is all surrounding Jerusalem, right? But we, we are 2,000 years removed from that. And we are reading it and we are reading as if, yeah, this thing, hap this, this thing happened yesterday. <laughs> Jesus said these words yesterday, so he was talking directly to us. No, he wasn't. <laughs> okay? So anyway, so when that day of the Lord happened, which, jo which Joel was predicting there, that was almost 600 years before Christ. Now in verse 28... We jump down here to verse 28, which will, as I said, we, we will cover in uh, another, in the, in the next point. It says there, and they shall come to pass afterward, right? This word afterward means in the, in the last part, okay? In the last part of Israel's um, existence, that I, that the Lord, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So here we're talking about the, um, the year 31. <laughs> so this was now uh, like 630 years later. This day of the Lord in verse 28 happened. It says, I will pour out the, the, my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And... And look what he says here now. Verse 31, The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So this is another day of the Lord, which, which was prophesied to come in the latter part <laughs> of Israel. And it would come during, the, during when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Good? So we're going to deal with that in our next point. But right now we're dealing with this, 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 this day of the Lord, which, which Joel talked about here in verse 1. That day of the Lord was near, <laughs> which means it would happen in the time of Joel. But the second one was far, and it would happen in the time of John. It would happen in the time of the apostles. It would happen in the time of the day of Pentecost. Uh, after the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Right? So when God says something is near, he means it's near. <laughs> he don't mean it 2,000 years away. So Isaiah also now, let's move on to another day of the Lord, where, which, in which the prophet Isaiah 
warned Babylon now of the day of the Lord which would come to that nation. So we go to Isaiah chapter 13. Right? So we're looking at the Lord's day. <laughs> All right? Isaiah chapter 13. Let's read from verse 1. The oracle concerning who? Babylon. Which Isaiah the son of Amos saw on a bare hill. Raise a signal. Cry aloud. Notice. Signal. Trumpet. Right? Trumpet is sounding. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the noble. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger. Day of judgment coming. Judgment coming. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude. Again, army is coming. <laughs> Enemy army is coming. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. This was the Medes and the Persians. Two nations gathered together to defeat Babylon. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They came from a distant land. From the end of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. The whole land of Babylon. <laughs> Always keep your context. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. And this was in the time of Babylon. So if God told Babylon that the day of the Lord is near. Did he mean 2,000 years away? <laughs> huh? No, he meant the day of the Lord would come in their time. It was coming. It was coming as destruction from the Almighty. Right? That's what the day of the Lord, a day of destruction, a day of judgment. And this day of the Lord was coming to, ba to Babylon and it was near. We can't say that day of the Lord is still coming. I mean, Babylon has already gone off the scene. <laughs> All right? So when you really study the word of the Lord, you see how ridiculous it is now that the modern church is still telling us about the, the day of the Lord that, uh, that uh, John was talking about. Is still, we are still looking for it today. <laughs> when Revelation said it was near, when Revelation said it was at hand, we can't be looking for that same day of the Lord. Maybe the Lord will judge in our time, yes. But not what was predicted and, and prophesied to happen in John's time. And even if God chooses to judge in our time, it says he will always inform his people what he's about to do. Right? <laughs> Okay, so he's not gonna say some. He's not gonna say um, two thousand years ago. He was going to do something in John's time and mean it for our time. No, not not like that. Let's look at Hosea. Hosea, his ministry was to the northern kingdom of Israel, and during the time of the first temple as well, that was some seven hundred years before Christ. Hosea indicated that a day of the Lord was coming on the northern tribes of Israel at that time. Remember, the kingdom of Israel had split just after Solomon's reign. So you had the southern kingdom went to uh, Judah and Benjamin. And they had the temple. And the northern remaining tribes... Uh, the remaining tribes formed the northern kingdom. But the day of the Lord, according to Hosea, was going to come to them. So Hosea chapter 5 verse 6. It says there, With their flocks and herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. Alright? So why has God withdrawn from them? Because they have broken his covenant. Right? They have committed spiritual adultery. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord. And they have borne alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them with their feasts. Blow the horn. Here again. Sound the trumpet. <laughs> Always remember that. John heard the trumpet sounding. 
So the day of the Lord that John that was talking about was not Sunday and Saturday. <laughs> it was the day of judgment. Blow the horn in Gibeon, the trumpet in Ramah, sound the alarm at Bet Aven. We follow you, O Benjamin. Right? Ephraim shall become what? A desolation in the day of punishment. You see, that's what the day of the, day of the Lord is about. A day of punishment. Day of judgment. A day, remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, 28, he says that he is coming in the glory of his Father with his angels to reward. Right? To reward and to punish. And there were people who were standing, listening at that time. He says they would be alive to see it. So the day of the Lord that Jesus was speaking about was one which would come in the time of the disciples, of the time, in the time of the apostles, in that generation. Right? But here we have a day of the Lord coming to the northern tribes. Right? Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to go after filth. We're going to skip some of this, skip some of this. Right? But the day of the Lord, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. The day of the Lord was because of Israel's uh, backsliding. Right? Because of Israel's backsliding. So in that day, which they were eagerly expecting because they thought God would defeat their enemies, right? Hosea revealed that it was Israel instead which would be defeated and scattered by their enemies because of their apostasy. So the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, was nothing new. <laughs> To the Hebrew people, it was nothing new to the disciples, was nothing new to the, the, the apostles. They understood the day of the Lord to be a day of judgment. And that day of judgment is what you read about in the book of Revelation. <laughs> when you see all the plagues being poured out. When you see uh, uh, the fire and the mountain thrown into the sea. And one third of the city fall and one third of the city burn. And the people run into the rocks and cry into the rocks, fall upon the, the, the mountains to, to, to fall upon them. All of that is the day of the Lord. It's the day of judgment. Right? Hebrew people understand what the day of the Lord was all about because they, these days of judgment were part of Israelite history. And so in the time of John, the day of the Lord was at hand. <laughs> the trumpet was sounding. The time of judgment had come to second temple Jerusalem this time. The second temple which was built by Zerubb Zerubbabel. Right? Paul told the believers in his time that the day of the Lord was coming. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 to 4. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 4. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now when Paul said the day of the Lord will come, he didn't mean will come 2,000 years away <laughs> from then. He meant the day of the Lord is coming in their time, and it is coming like a thief in the night. Right? He says, while people are saying there is peace and security, while people are, the people in Paul's time <laughs> were saying peace and safety, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, the people in Paul's time. <laughs> As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they... These people in Paul's time, in John's time, in the Apostles' time, 
in that last generation, they will not escape. Paul was speaking here specifically of the corporate Israel, fleshly Israel, which were persecuting the body of Christ, which were persecuting the believers, which were persecuting the remnant. And they thought that they were doing God a favor. So that is why they said, oh, we are living in peace and security because we are carrying out God's work in persecuting this heretical movement who are following this false prophet Jesus. <laughs> right? But Paul said, sudden destruction will come upon them and they will not escape. He was not talking about people 2,000 years away in the 21st century. He was talking about people in his time. So the revelation given to John on the Isle of Patmos revealed that the day of the Lord had come to Jerusalem and it was about to break upon the unsuspecting Israelites. The judgment that Jesus had warned about had come and John heard the day of the Lord trumpet already sounding. The time of Jerusalem's visitation had come and we will look at point number 24 when I come back. So we are about to look at point number 24. And point number 24 says, The day of the Lord happened in John's time. The day of the Lord, the Lord's day, happened in John's time. On our text for that point are Revelation 1.10, Malachi 4.5, Matthew 17, 12 to 13, Matthew 3, verse 7, Joel 2, verse 28 to 31. Luke 21, 20 to 24, 32 and 34, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 4. All right? So let us go to our Bible and we look at our main point for this, our main scripture for this point, Revelation 1, 10. It says there, I, that is John, the Apostle John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet and in our previous point we established that this Lord's day or this day of the Lord was not a day of the week <laughs> it's not Saturday it's not Sunday nor was it any 24 hour period but it was a time of judgment which historically the, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people understood that days of the Lord were days of judgment. And one was coming upon Jerusalem in John's time. It is worthy of note that the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets along with John the Baptist, along with Jesus, and along with the apostles, they all indicated that the Lord's day would occur or that the final Lord's day for Israel, let me put it that way, would occur in the time of the last generation of Israel. That same generation to whom Jesus was sent to and that same generation to whom the apostles were ministering. In other words, that generation who lived in John's time. For example, Malachi the prophet, let's go to Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. It says there, Malachi wrote, Behold, I will send you, the Lord will send you. Who is the you? Well, let's see. Let's go back to verse 4. 
Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at, Ar- at Horeb for all Israel. So the you there are, are all Israel who were keeping the Mosaic covenant. Right? Israel under the covenant of Moses or the Sinai covenant. Right? So that was to whom God would send Elijah the prophet who was who we will see is really John the Baptist manifest, right? But anyway, so he says, Behold, I will send to you, all covenant Israel, Elijah the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Right? (laughs) So the day of the Lord was to come in the time of old covenant Israel. The day of the Lord (laughs) that John the Baptist preached about. Right? And why would I say John the Baptist? Because let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 12. Or matter of fact, let's say, let's read from verse 10. Let's read from verse 10 for, for more context. And the disciples asked him, that is Jesus, The disciples asked Jesus, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Because of what Malachi said. Okay? Malachi said Elijah must come. Jesus answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. (laughs) That is something like what we are saying today. Jesus has already come. Same problem. Israel could not, did not have a spiritual mindset. Right? So they were looking for a literal Elijah. Okay? But Jesus said to them, Elijah has already come and they did not what? Recognize him. (laughs) Same thing like today. Christ has already come. And, his, and, and, and the modern church did not recognize, has not recognized, and refused to recognize him. But they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of what? John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was Elijah the manifestation or the fulfillment of Elijah the prophet. And Elijah the prophet was to come in the time of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the great and the awesome day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord that John the Baptist would be preaching about would be the day of the Lord that Malachi talked about. (laughs) Right? Because if we go back to uh, Malachi 4, I will send you, so we, let's plug in here. I will send you John the Baptist before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Did he mean I will send John the Baptist 2,000 plus years before the day of the Lord? <laughs> well, maybe, but when we, when we consider this word here, before, this word before, actually is the, he, the, the, the Hebrew word ponim. Right? See it there? Ponim. It means in the face of. Right? In the face of. Right? So in the face or in the presence of. That does not give the impression of a distance, a great distance away. Right, So from the time you see John the Baptist or the, the Elijah the prophet show up, know that the day of the Lord will soon follow on. That's, that's what that, that um, word ponim is giving the, the imagery that the day of the Lord was, that, that the Elijah the prophet would come in the face or in the, in the presence of the day of the Lord. The great and awesome day of the Lord. Right? 
So John the Baptist was therefore, his ministry was therefore to be a sign of the nearness of the day of the Lord. The Lord's day. And he, John the Baptist, preached that God's wrath was near and it was about to be poured out. Look at Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. Look at John the Baptist's message. But when he, and that's John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, this wrath that was coming would come in the time where the Pharisees would attempt to flee from it. So it was coming in the time of the Pharisees. All right? As a matter of fact, if you look at this word in, uh, let me see if I put it in one of these other translations, the Berean Literal Bible, for example. It says, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? All right? That's not so clear. In the concordant literal version, it says, the impending, <laughs> the impending indignation, right? So it was, it was impending. It was at their door. That's what the word impending mean, right? It is not, it was not a, a, a day of the Lord or a judgment or a destruction that was 2,000 years away. If it was 2,000 years away, make no sense. John even mentioning it. Um, to the people of his time because they would not be able to do anything about that. <laughs> right? So that judgment, that day of the Lord that John the Baptist was preaching about was the day of the Lord that Malachi was talking about. The day of the Lord which would come when, when uh, Elijah the prophet was sent. And Elijah the prophet, according to Jesus Christ, was fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. And when the ministry of John the Baptist began, it was a sign that the day of the Lord was impending. Right? So remember in, in, in point number 23, I mentioned that in Joel chapter 2, there are two days of the Lord mentioned. In verse 1, there was the day of the Lord which was coming, or which came to uh, uh, Jerusalem on the, the first temple, the Solomon temple. But then in verse 28, he, sp he speaks now about a last day's day of the Lord. Okay, so let's go, to the, let's go back there. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. He speaks about another day of the Lord. <clears throat> so the day of the Lord was not something unique <laughs> to Jesus' uh, prophetic uh, teachings. The day of the Lord was throughout the history of Israel. They had days of the Lord. So Joel said, and it shall come to pass afterward. This word afterward, let me show it to you. In your lexicon, it says the hind part, right? So it's the hind part, the hind end or the last part, okay? In, Pete, in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, Peter interprets this as in the last days. Right? In the last part of Israel. Let's go back to our Bible. So it shall come to, part in the, come to pass in the last part, the last, the last part of Israel, the last part of the Sinai Covenant, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Well, when did this happen? <laughs> this happened in the year 31. That would have been 630 years after this prophecy was made. Right? So indeed, it was 
in the last part. Okay? I will pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. This is exactly what, G, what um, Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. And look what, look what would follow on from that outpouring of the spirit. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. <laughs> so we have John the Baptist's ministry appearing in fulfillment of uh, Elijah the prophet, who was, according to Malachi 4.5, to show up before or in the face of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now we have the Holy Spirit would be poured out to be followed by the great and awesome day of the Lord. <laughs> right? And that was supposed to happen in the hind part or the last part of Israel's days. And in Malachi, the day of the Lord was to come to those people who are keeping the law of Moses. Right? So therefore, this day of the Lord that, that the apostles and Jesus Christ were teaching about and, and Malachi was teaching about and Joel was prophesying about was is not a day of the lord that is to we are to look forward for in our time nor in our future it was a day of the lord that would and did happen in the time of john <laughs> and that day of the lord culminated ultimately in the destruction of the temple at jerusalem that second the second temple which was the zerubbabel temple which was also called herod's temple and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and the destruction of Israel, and the destruction of its people. Right? So, let's look at Luke chapter 21. So, this idea that uh, the modern church is scaring people with, it's, it's a fantasy. Right? It's a fear-mongering tactic. Jesus said in Luke, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation had come there. This is the day of the Lord had come to Jerusalem. Because the day of the Lord, as we saw historically, was carried, was carried, uh, carried, uh, was implemented by enemy armies. <laughs> right? Happened that way to Babylon. Happened that way to First Temple Jerusalem. <clears throat> happened to the northern uh, kingdom of Israel. Now it would happen to Jerusalem in the time of John. And this was what Jesus was predicting here. When you, and who is the you? <laughs> the you is not us. The you, the you was the disciples living at that time. They would see Jerusalem surrounded by armies and then they would know that the, the, the desolation had come near. He says, then let those who are where? In Judea, not in France and America and Europe and Asia. <laughs> in Judea, right? Flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter in it enter it for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this this people was that was the this people the people of jerusalem <laughs> the people who were inside the city the people who are in the land of Judea. <laughs> right? But you see, when, you, when you're reading something and your mind has been programmed to think that this, oh, this is speaking about our time and we are to look forward for this, then you ignore all of that. <laughs> you ignore Judea. You ignore Jerusalem. You ignore this people. You ignore this generation. And you make all of it apply to us in the 21st century. That's not good exegesis. That's twisting the scripture. 
they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations and where Jerusalem will be trampled on the foot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That was the day of the Lord that Jesus was speaking about. Look at verse 32. Christ again says, Truly I say to you, this generation, well, after all mentoring Jerusalem, this people, Judea, <laughs> surrounding the city, would now when he says this generation, would he mean a generation 2,000 years later? <laughs> would he so all of a sudden jump out of context and start speaking about some few some other generation and even so he said it was this meaning the generation to whom he was speaking to again we fail to realize that jesus was speaking to living breathing people sitting there standing there listening to him so when he said this generation they understood him to be speaking about them right this generation will not pass away until all has taken place that's why he same similarly he said in matthew 16 he says there are some standing here who will not taste, taste that until they see me coming on the clouds which is the same day of the lord he came coming on the clouds mean coming in judgment <laughs> right and then verse 34 says, But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that, and that day, <laughs> that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. What day is that? The day of the Lord. Everything he said there are elements and were elements of day of the Lord. When you read Isaiah, same thing, enemy armies coming up. You read Hosea, enemy armies coming up. You read Joel, enemies, enemy armies coming up. All of these things were elements of the day of the Lord. Right? So that day in Luke 21, 34 is the day of the Lord. <laughs> okay? So after Jesus had spoken to his disciples concerning the signs leading up to the to the destruction of the temple, the second temple, the, 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 the Zerubbabel temple, the Herod's temple, he said to them that they should be watchful so that the day does not come on them unawares or to trap them. That day is the same day that John the Baptist a.k.a. Elijah the prophet was pre preaching of <laughs> the wrath that was to come. Okay? And then Paul, in line with what Jesus said, in line with what John the Baptist said, in line with what Malachi said, in line with what Joel said, said to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, Paul preaching to the Thessalonians in his time said, For you yourselves, you yourselves, who, who are you yourselves? The Thessalonians. <laughs> he says they were fully aware that what? The day of the Lord will come. Like a thief in the night. Right? Well, if it came to the Thessalonians like a thief in the night, it means they had fallen asleep. And then the day had, would come as a trap to them, which was what Jesus said they, must, they should not allow to happen. <laughs> okay? So while people are saying there is peace and security, these would be people in Paul's time. People in the Thessalonians' time were saying there is peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them, the people in John's time, the people in Thessalonians' time. Right? He says, but you, Thessalonians, are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. 
So notice the day was coming in the time of the Thessalonians. The day of the Lord. The fact that there was a chance that it could surprise them like a thief means it was coming in their time. <laughs> But because they were of the day, it means that they, they, they had light from the gospel and the, the, the teachings of, of the, the apostles, right? They had light from Christ. Therefore, the day would not come as a thief to them. But it was coming to them. It was coming to reward them, right? Because a thief doesn't come to reward, <laughs> right? The bridegroom comes to reward, right? So the day would come to them like a bridegroom, but to those who were unprepared, it would come like a thief, right? It would come to kill, to steal, and to destroy, right? So the great and awesome day of the Lord, and some translations have the great and dreadful day of the Lord, was coming in the time of John. All right. There is absolutely nothing in the writings of the apostles. There is absolutely nothing in the teachings of Christ that could give the slightest impression that the day of the Lord, that they were speaking of, is in our future, 2,000 years later. And the Revelation chapter 1 indicated that John had been kept alive to see the arrival of this day of the Lord in fulfillment of the writings of Malachi, in fulfillment of the writings of Joel, in fulfillment of the teachings of John the Baptist, in fulfillment of the teachings of Christ, and in fulfillment of the teachings of the apostles. He and some who were standing there listening to Jesus would witness it. And as with all the other events in the vision of the revelation, the Lord's day would and did come to pass in John's time. And so we have come to the end to the end of this eighth video in the series concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter one. This vision, this video was entitled "The Tribulation and the Lord's Day." Now, remember, if you appreciate this content, please like, please share please subscribe and you may support this ministry by giving or by purchasing one or both of my books or by purchasing from the merchandise store and so until next time i'm your friend murray saying may god richly bless you this has been the new cosmos video cast subscribe and share.